So first of all, why is Britain having this um, referendum? Um, Britain joined in the early 1970s at a time of national weakness. Um, in the 1970s, Britain was a nation that was, it felt, in decline. The Wall Street Journal famously in the 1970s said um, investors should give up on Britain. It was an ungovernable um, nation. Um, it was a nation racked by the troubles in Northern Ireland. And at the time, the European Union, which of course was called the European Economic Community then, was seen as the future. And uh, despite what His Excellency um, suggested, um, whether it was in the treaty that ever closer union was key to European identity, it was not understood by the British people. They were told, and all of, and that all of the <laughs> literature was very much that it was an economic free trade area that Britain was joining, not something of political identity. So certainly it is a lesson. Always read the small print before you sign any contract. And the British people perhaps didn't sufficiently read the treaty. But opinion polls of the time and opinion polls since certainly have confirmed that Britain um, did not know quite the nature of the project that it was, that it was joining. Um, since, since then, um, the immigration problems that this country at the moment is, is, is wrestling with, the whole of Europe is wrestling with, um, the failure of the Eurozone project, Britain, like Hungary, is very grateful not to be part of the, of the single currency. Um, the overwhelming view, 75% of the British people are glad that Britain stayed out of the Euro, and I think the, the unemployment that it has created across the south of Europe in particular um, is, I think, uh, evidence of the social damage that it has done. Um, and, a, um, a, a, and a budget... Um, for the European Union, of which Britain is a very large net contributor. So Britain, for example, puts in about 17 or 18 billion pounds in every year, um, a net contribution of about 12 billion pounds, depending upon, upon the estimates. And uh, a lot of people in Britain do not think uh, uh, that is good value for money. Um, Margaret Thatcher, probably the most uh, influential uh, Prime Minister of the post-war period uh, became more and more Eurosceptic as her time in office began. She supported Britain staying in the European Union when we had our referendum in 1975 and there's a famous picture of her that if you Google it you can see her in a, a very funny jumper covered with the European flags. Um, she wouldn't be seen dead in it by the time she um, <laughs> ended her premiership because she became a great Eurosceptic. And in a famous speech given in Bruges, um, near the end of her premiership, <coughs> excuse me, she made a famous observation that said, we have not rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain, only to, be, to see them reimposed upon Britain at a European level. And that really was an electric moment in the history of the Conservative Party. Within a year or so after she gave that speech, she had been brought down as Conservative leader by Euro enthusiasts within the Conservative Party, who, for a number of reasons, not just Europe, but that was one of the key reasons, felt that she was no longer fit to be Prime Minister, taking such a Eurosceptic view. And I think at that point, the people in favour of Britain's position in, in Europe thought they had won in deposing her. But actually it was only the beginning of what has been a massive shift in opinion within the Conservative Party. Slowly, year by year, more and more of the candidates, more and more of the MPs becoming more and more Eurosceptic. And in a sense, the Conservative Party, in holding this referendum, is fulfilling the marching orders that Margaret Thatcher gave to it. And I do not see the huge debate, probably the biggest division in the Conservative Party, the biggest division in, in British politics, this question of Britain's relationship with Europe, it can only be resolved by the British people in a vote. Only when the British people have decided emphatically, one way or the other, whether to leave or to stay, will this question retreat to, to the sidelines. Now, it is another question, of course, whether we will have an emphatic 
referendum result. We had a referendum about Scotland's membership of the United Kingdom a year ago. I, su I suspect some of you noticed. And um, in one, the union won. Um, but it was only 55% by 45%. And rather than finishing the issue, it has just kept alive. And we have an expression now that's entered the British vocabulary, approved by the Oxford English Dictionary. We no, lo we no longer have um, just a referendum. We have something called a never-endum. <laughs> and it's the idea that you do not solve issues with a referendum, but you just have these debates going on and on. So I cannot promise you that this will be the final decision. Um, lots of the Eurosceptics I know do not expect to win this referendum, but as long as they get more than 40% of the vote, they believe that they will keep the issue alive and that the issue will be returned to soon afterwards. <coughs> so my, the second set of questions, the second question I want to answer is what are the arguments of both sides for staying in or for leaving? What are the key arguments that will determine the outcome? Um, the first argument for the campaign for staying in, which was launched in London this time last week, the campaign was called British Britain Stronger in Europe, um, which is slightly unfortunate in Britain because those initials BSE um, are also the initials that, if you were in Britain, are associated with mad cow disease. <laughs> um, so it's not the most f sensible of campaigns because when you say BSE to most British people, it's not a good thing. Um, it's uh, associated with one of Britain's least attractive um, and least happy chapters. Um, they perhaps need to change their name if I was giving them PR advice. But their key argument, I think, their top argument is that outside of the European Union, Britain will be subject to economic rules that it cannot help shape. So that um, we will be part still of the single market, but we won't have a seat at the table to help form those, those, those rules. The second key argument that the um, in campaign will make is that it will not be a, a happy separation or a happy divorce. That we could enter a period of years of divorce negotiations where it's very complicated um, arrangements about renegotiating trade and justice and uh, legal arrangements of various kinds and almost nothing else will happen in British politics for a number of years. I recently debated this question of European Union membership with Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, used to be an EU commissioner and interestingly this was one of the arguments he kept making. Now he wouldn't be making that argument if he didn't think it would have some resonance with the, the public. The public will be told if you do vote to leave nothing will happen in politics for a couple of years other than divorce negotiations. Um, the third key argument that the BSE campaign I think will make will be if we vote to leave the European Union, it will almost certainly lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom as well. And, and they say that because England is much more Eurosceptic than Scotland. And the opinion polls suggest that Scotland does not want to leave the European Union, even if England might want to leave the European Union. And one of the triggers that the Scottish Nationalist Government has for holding another referendum, neverendum, um, campaign is that if the rest of the UK votes to leave the European Union, Scotland will can potentially consider voting to leave the UK again. So that is another threat on the other side. So that's the in campaign. Um, the out campaign, what are their key arguments? The first one, which enjoys massive approval with the British people, is that Britain will again be able to control its borders. Um, the British government has been elected on a pledge to reduce net immigration to the tens of thousands, under 100,000 a year. At the moment, immigration into Britain is running at about 350,000 um, net. It is the top issue in British politics at the moment, immigration. Um, the public, um, while supportive of some immigration, think that it's too large. They link it rightly or rightly to very... Um, serious house price inflation and the depressed wages of low-income people. Um, Theresa May, the Home Secretary, gave a very uh, controversial speech um, a week or so ago at the party conference, the Conservative Party conference, 
in which she seemed to be suggesting that and she could not achieve immigration targets so long as Britain was a member of the European Union. I personally think she may become one of the leading members of the cabinet who will support Britain leaving the EU and campaign on the immigration issue as a result. An unlikely leader of the Eurosceptic right, but now a real possibility. Um, I mentioned the net contribution, £12 billion um, to spend. There is already a very powerful advert uh, being on YouTube, which has been seen by hundreds of thousands of people and, hope, and will probably by millions soon, which says that as soon as we leave the European Union, we will be able to spend £12 billion on the National Health Service. And that is something that is also very popular. And the final key argument for the out campaign is we will take control again. And so the, the slogan of the um, Vote Leave campaign is Leave, Take Control. And it is the idea is that Britain will be determining its human rights laws, will be determining who comes into the country, will be determining how budgets are spent, and will also, and this is the other flip side of the idea that you will lose economic influence by not being in the European Union, that Britain will have seats at the World Trade Organization. Britain will have seats at all the sorts of international organizations where currently Britain is represented by the European Union. So for example, at the moment, the British agricultural industry is only represented by a European official, whereas at the World Trade Organization and other bodies, New Zealand, Australia, countries much, much smaller than Britain have their own representative in, in all of these, these <coughs> talks. And that is the, the reason. So what is likely to, to happen? Who is going to, to win? Um, the in hope that strong business leadership, business are already warning, uh, are largely against Britain leaving. Um, and there may well be a strong fear campaign that Britain will lose many jobs if we leave the European Union, that somehow Europe will not give Britain a good trade deal. Um, I personally, and this is an opinion, um, um, rather than giving you a fact, I think that is very unlikely. Britain has a massive trade deficit with the rest of, of Europe. If Europe was to say we're not going to trade or give Britain disadvantaged trade terms, um, I tell you who will be our strongest allies in those talks, Mercedes. Um, the uh, French wine industry, the Italian hotel industry, the Greek tourist industry, the French nuclear industry. The idea that Europe, when it has a trade deficit with Britain and is already a continent with economic problems, is going to make those problems worse, that seems to me um, very, un very unlikely. Um, the other big hope for the um, in campaign is that David Cameron's renegotiation will succeed that he will change Britain's relationship with the European Union. Um, there will be people around this table, including the ambassadors, who may have a, a better view from this. But the view in London is at the moment there is very little progress in renegotiation. That uh, Angela Merkel, who um, London has pinned a lot of hope on to deliver renegotiation, has problems of her own, and it is not clear what kind of deal Britain will get. When you have the immigration crisis, when you have the Eurozone crisis, Europe has bigger things on its mind than the always awkward Britain asking for a different kind of um, relationship. And the other um, argument, the, the, the actual question on the ballot paper is should Britain remain in the European Union or leave the European Union? So the campaigns are not yes or no or in or out, they are remain or leave. Now, one of the arguments that the um, out campaign must make is that actually there is no remain on, on the ballot paper, that there is no status quo on offer, that whatever Britain chooses, it's a risky option. Yes, it is risky to leave the European Union and become an independent nation and take our chances, but actually it's risky to stay in as well, because if Britain stays in, it is part of this ever closer Union. It is part, is not part of the Eurozone Club, where it can be outvoted. And if, it, as it is nearly regularly outvoted in the Council of Ministers, if Britain reaffirms its membership, will Britain be taken for granted like never before? Will Britain be 
not just excluded from the normal, normal Franco-German axis, but be seen as a troublemaking nation, but that barks constantly, but when it had an opportunity to leave the European Union, it didn't bite, and therefore its influence will decline. Um, that, in the focus groups that um, are taking place, is also a powerful, a powerful argument. So I think the referendum will be held in the spring of 2017, um, there's a four-month trigger that needs to be held before David Cameron can say a referendum is going to be held, and it actually held. We don't run referenda in Britain like they do in Crimea with just one week's notice, or in Greece where it's two weeks' notice. There has to be, I think, four, four months' um, uh, notice. Um, <coughs> I don't think it could be held in the autumn because it's, an autumn referendum is when immigration can, um, issue is at its height. You have a summer where people are trying to cross the Mediterranean to Europe. We have our annual immigration statistics. Um, it seems to be that um, leave out gets about a 5% boost in the autumn. So because the renegotiation is not complete, because of the four-month trigger, because you don't want to hold a referendum in the autumn, I think the spring of 2017 will be when the vote, the vote happens. And so finally, before I sit down, who will win? Well, as Jerry has already said, the opinion polls at the moment are too close to call. Um, you have some with a very, very narrow lead for leave, some with a slightly larger lead for out. The fact is that a third of the British people are absolutely determined to leave whatever happens. Those people are whiter, older, angrier, more traditional, and they care about immigration. And they will vote to to leave. And then, then there is a third, they live in London, more liberal, more left-wing, younger, um, they want to stay in. And then the rest of Britain is up for, for debate. And they will probably be swayed by the economic arguments more than anything else, which is why the out campaign probably won't talk that much about immigration because that immigration issue is taken for, for granted. And it will be who can win the economic argument? What ultimately will figure most in British people's mind? The idea that Europe is a declining continent, that we don't want to be part of anymore, and our economic future is better decoupling from it, or the argument that this is still a, a continent that has economic power and economic market that we want to help shape. Will it be the idea that we can spend the money that we're currently spending on the European Union better ourselves, or will it be the idea that somehow we'd be isolated outside of the European Union? I should, of course, state that nobody wants to leave the, the free market inside the European Union. It's just a question of leaving, leaving uh, Europe's political apparatus. Um, I think, ultimately, Britain will vote to stay in, um, because I think the economic arguments are slightly more powerful on staying in, and because the British people are small c conservative and generally opt for the status quo. But my goodness, it's far from clear what will happen. And particularly if you get in a period where David Cameron is unpopular, and the issue isn't Europe, but it's the popularity of the government. Donald Trump, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Justin Trudeau, probably in, Australia, in Canada today, this is a time when Politics is moving in volatile and unexpected ways, and I wouldn't want to, to bet either way. My final observation, I've talked almost completely about Britain's interests here rather than Europe's wider interests. Let me, let me just say, in the, finally, why I think Brexit is in Europe's interest too, as a final a piece of, a, of opinion. I think Europe is a great continent, the, a cradle of some of the greatest ideas that has been given to the world. But I think at the moment is a continent in pretty serious decline if you look at how the Eurozone has affected the economy, you look at the level of welfare bills, you look at the demography of Europe, um, and you look at our position um, as a continent in trading terms. Europe hasn't been shocked out of its complacency by the immigration crisis. It hasn't been shocked out of its complacency um, by the uh, Greek crisis. 
and it hasn't been shocked out of its complacency by the situation with Russia on its borders. I wonder what will shock Europe to take the kind of, make the kind of reforms that are interested in all of its citizens. Perhaps one of its most important nations saying, we no longer want to be part of this club, we think we have a brighter future outside of it, might just be the wake-up call that, that Europe needs. And so, yes, I want Britain to leave the European Union for Britain's sake, but I absolutely want Britain to leave the European Union for the whole of Europe's sake um, as well. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I think it was very stimulating, and I've made 11 oh. notes. I always number them. So, ladies, gentlemen, excellencies, or in any order. Um, let me put myself uh, in, just as you said, you were on, on balance in favor of, uh, we would vote to leave. I remain a moderate integrationist, um, basically for two reasons. One is, which I don't think weighs with the British electorate, is that the European integration process is the best conflict resolution mechanism that Europe has ever had. And that's important. It's important if you come from this part of the world. Um, and that, I think, is something which has never resonated on the far side of the channel. Secondly, I believe that the Central European countries have something to contribute and if they act together, they, they have a contribution to make, they can make their voices heard. For me, one of the great disappointments of the last 11 years is that Britain, which had any amount of goodwill in Central Europe, has squandered it. We just ignored the Central European countries. I think it's a great mistake. I think that Britain could have led the Central European countries, but it didn't happen. So, um, there's, there's no logical order in, in that I'm going to follow. To some extent, it's as you uh, raised issues. First of all, uh, the consequences of Brexit for Britain. And here it seems to me, I think you've skated a bit lightly over uh, the Scotland problem. I, I should convey to everybody that I grew up in Scotland and my British identity and I have one is a Scottish one. And I know that if you're all parachuted, into Glasgow, you won't understand a thing, but I will. Uh, so, um, for me, I, mean, I follow the Scottish debate closely with some sympathy. Um, I don't have a problem with Scotland becoming independent. But if Scotland does become independent, Britain will no longer be Britain. It'll be England. It will be shrunk. And I suspect it will not be taken all that seriously. And by the way, there are serious, serious problems with Northern Ireland. If, Brit if Britain chooses to leave the European Union, I have no idea what happens in Northern Ireland. But the relationship between the six counties and the 26 is going to be on a totally different footing, and not necessarily for the better. And my Irish colleagues in Parliament are very concerned. They're very concerned about all sorts of things, but particularly about that. Um, and England, with or without the Welsh, and maybe even the Cornish would leave you, <laughs> who knows. Uh, if any of you have been to Cornwall, you will know that they, they talk about going to England. Uh, I, that always struck me as being rather charming, actually. Um, and they talk about the English as Emmets. I don't know if you knew that. Um, be that as it may. Uh, uh, an England which will be a medium-sized state, but I'm not sure, for example, it would be able to hold on to its Security Council seat. There are all sorts of implications. I'll go on to the geopolitics of it in a, in a moment. Um, what I th you haven't really touched on, and I think is important, I've written about this, but nobody pays a blind bit of attention to these things, um, the English identity. Now, for a long time, back in the 1950s, the English talked about England, meaning the United Kingdom, or meaning Britain. Gradually, the, sometime in the 60s, it sort of switched. There was never any kind of threshold. And they talked about themselves as being British and the United Kingdom as being British. Now, this drove the Scots up the wall. Um, and by about the 80s, the Scots would say, we are not British, we are Scottish. Because British by then had become the English identity. And it seems to me from conversations I've had, there is an English identity trying to find the voice. For me, 
And possibly this is the moment when I decided that I was no longer living in this country. It was in 96, and for the first time, you could see large numbers of St. George's flags uh, in the streets. And I can't identify with that. Union Jack, I could sort of cope with. I still have a British passport. Um, and that, obviously, this is at the street level. It's to do with football. The Scots had been uh, arriving with Scottish flags and so on and so forth. But I think that having conversations with friends who said, well, actually, yes, you know, I am English, and that has to mean something. And I think that Englishness in this relatively subsurface, not quite subterranean, but subcutaneous level, is about differentiating myself from the continent. Now, if you look at the red tops, what you will see is a near racist differentiation from France and Germany. Uh, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, you, you see what the red tops write about the continent, about Brussels. If you were to substitute Jew or black, you would see how racist it is. It's certainly stereotyping things. Um, one of the things which always amuses me in a sad kind of way, they talk about the bloated Brussels bureaucracy. So I say, well, how many people does Brussels employ? And they say, 300,000. Well, the answer is 30,000. It's smaller than the administration of Liverpool. Uh, but no, those issues don't get through. There is this kind of symbolic Brussels, which is deep, deeply loathed and detested. Um, the regulation, which you sort of touched on, there is no question there's over-regulation coming from Brussels, although actually it's being cut back. But most of that, I would say 50-60% of it, is gold plating. It's the, the, regula the over-regulation launched by Whitehall, Whitehall, it's not EU regulation, and those regulations would not disappear. Health and safety regulations would not disappear uh, if Britain were to leave. Um, and I think that the English identity issue is there beneath the economic one. And I think that would actually determine far more than looking at the pluses and minuses. Um, what's my fourth point? Um, control of borders, yes, I, I mean, I, I, you're absolutely right. I think this is a major issue. Uh, note that uh, in, originally, so two or three years ago, two thirds of the immigration going into the UK was non European. By now, it's about 50 50. Um, if indeed uh, European migrants were to be blocked, which I don't think can happen uh, as long as Britain is a member, I don't think there's any concession possible on that, we will see what kind of impact it has. And what happens to those who are already there? What kind of, I mean, we're talking of probably 1.8, 2 million people. And by the way, what happens to the 2 to 3 million Brits who live in the other European, in the European countries? The retirees in the south of Spain and uh, France and other spots. And this, you know, what happens to them? Are they, will they then still be entitled to social welfare services and issues of this kind? If there is Brexit, it will take many, many years, at least two, but probably more, to negotiate. Um, Yes, I've talked about this issue now. Uh, you haven't mentioned the city. I think if Britain were to leave the European Union, the entire Euro market would be transferred to Frankfurt. That'd be a serious, a city is very concerned about Brexit. Just, just as everyone said, well, if, if we stayed out of the Euro, that would happen. And uh, it never did. More likely to happen now. Things have moved on. I mean, I think Frankfurt is a much... It, I think it's hard to make that threat twice. Uh, no, it, no it I'm not saying it as a threat. No, I'm, I'm just um, saying it's an argument that I think uh, is it, in, in terms of campaigning... I know in, I know in Britain that argument won't fly at all again. That's fine. But, uh, I mean, uh, just but, but then the shock will be all the greater. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I mean, as you know, you know Goldman Sachs uh, and Deutsche Bank have already said we will seriously think about something uh, moving out of London. But, okay, you could take it as a threat, you can take it as a... Uh, declaration of intent. Um, geopolitics, you sort of touched on, it seems to me that it's worth adding that the United States is not very happy about Britain uh, leaving the European Union. Um, the United States would like Britain to stay to have a voice in Brussels as representing to some degree American interests. For that reason, I think many people on the continent would actually like Britain to go. 
because they don't necessarily want the United States sticking their noses. This is the Trojan horse, this is the Gaul's Trojan horse argument. So it, 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 it's interesting. On renegotiation, um, I see things, the timetable, somewhat differently from you because I actually think treaty change is now back on the agenda. Um, when Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel, came to Parliament in Strasbourg, she had a meeting with the EPP group and then the plenary, and she said the Lisbon Treaty can't be the final treaty of the European Union. There must be political development. She used the term politische Entwicklung. Um, and therefore, we can't exclude treaty change. Now, this is quite extraordinary, given everything that has been said here. Too. It may be linked with Brexit, but there's a great many other things where the Lisbon Treaty, I think, does need changing. So, I'm not saying it will, but I can conceive of a scenario that uh, a convention is called immediately after the French and German elections, so in about a year's time. The convention will be different from the previous one, a short one, and at that point, the Brexit argument, the, the treaty changes needed for Britain could actually be on the agenda. Um, I, I think it's right that the Germans would prefer Britain to stay in, and the French too. But if Britain goes, then fine. You know, I mean, I, there won't be too many. In fact, in some places, there will be a considerable relief. I can hear the, the words, quel soulagement, coming out of Paris quite loudly. Um, on the Eurozone, uh, yes, um, I think that's right. Um, there are nine on the Eurozone countries. We do have an interest, and if Britain goes, that makes our lives a bit more difficult. Um, to what extent the Eurozone countries are ready to listen to the Preans, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that's it. Uh, so we disagree on the date. As when I mean, I think it's quite likely to be that the, uh, the Cameron, I think, has just accelerated the, the whole process. Uh, that's, I think that they're coming up with something quite serious, um, probably for the December summit, uh, some actually concrete requirements. It may be going faster than we think, but we will see. Thank you very much.